Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good morning and welcome to our online service for Sunday the 8th of August. This week we are delighted once again to welcome Reverend Hasna as our guest preacher and she will be sharing with us on this week's discipline, the spiritual discipline of confession. So we've had inward disciplines and we've had outward disciplines and now we come to four corporate disciplines and confession is the first of these. Corporate disciplines, things we engage in together as the body of Christ. But confession is a tricky one, isn't it? Sometimes uh, we don't like to get too specific. Um, maybe we think that it's actually quite a personal and inward one. So why is it put here in corporate? Why is a Christian discipline of confession important to us as a body, as a congregation and as an individual? And how does it help us in our discipleship journey? Well, look forward to um, being challenged again by Hasna's wisdom on all of those questions. And like last week, like every week, there are further resources for reflection that you can find in the newsletter. And of course, if you want to get hold of the book, you can read in more detail about what Richard Foster says about the discipline of confession. So as we gather, uh, as we gather this morning as a church family, some of us are here online. Some of us are in the church building and um, some of us are still on paper in their homes. Let's pause for a moment as a body of Christ um, to bring before God all of the times uh, that we reflected on in the last week where we wish actually we'd behaved a little bit differently. We come to God as one from whom no secrets are hidden, to ask for his forgiveness and peace. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And this week's collect, Lord of heaven and earth, as Jesus taught his disciples to be persistent in prayer, give us patience and courage never to lose hope, but always to bring our prayers before you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
The lesson is from Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 to 9. See the Lord's hand is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. No one brings suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas, they speak lies, conceiving mischief and begetting iniquity. They hatch out as eggs and weave the spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs dies, and the crushed egg hatches out a viper. Their webs cannot serve as clothing, they cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity and deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they rush to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. Their roads they have made crooked, no one who walks in them knows peace. Therefore, justice is far from us and righteousness does not reach us. We wait for a light and lo, there is darkness and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and travelled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is living again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Hello, my name is Hasna, and Susie has asked me to do this little talk on the discipline of confession from Richard Foster's classic text, Celebration of Discipline. Foster begins this chapter with a quote from a North African saint, Saint Augustine of Hippo who once stated that the confession of evil works is the first beginning of good works. The confession of evil works is the first beginning of good works. So confession is great. So that's an incentive, whether one is a follower of Christ or not, that good comes out of confession, that wrongdoing is sent to a destination. 
because of the crucifixion, we can be forgiven for our sins. Indeed, confession is, from my perspective, another motorway journey to God. A bit like the M40 in the evenings. It's really fast. <laughs> it's a quick route to closeness to God. It's also a route to healing for the perpetrator and for the victim, usually. So I would consider that to be the perfect scenario in terms of an outcome from confession in an ideal world. The regular notion that it is God's wrath that took Jesus to the cross so that we can confess our sins freely and be forgiven instantaneously needs examination, however. You see, it's not God's wrath, but it is God's love that took Jesus to the cross. In fact, that's one of the critiques of uh, some very uh, well-known discipleship courses, its obsession with the atonement and in God's wrath. It's about God's love. When he was uh, hung on the cross, our sins were nullified and redeemed because of that one event. When he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was at that moment the greatest triumph happened, for it was at that moment Jesus identified with humankind. It was in that moment he experienced the abandonment of God. The discipline of confession and forgiveness transforms us. According to Foster, without the cross, confession is apparently just psychological. However, I do wonder, since we're all made in God's image, I wonder if God is beyond that exclusivity of confession by Christians. What I mean is that just because someone is not a follower of Christ, does not mean that God doesn't want to hear their confession. I'm sure that God acknowledges remorse in all of his creation. However, I can honestly say that as a convert from another faith, I would wholeheartedly recommend confessing to Jesus our Lord and Saviour. I love that Jesus states that confession is both a discipline and of grace. Sometimes we can go round in circles trying to forgive someone and the same old stuff just keeps popping up. But with God's grace, it may be possible to move on. It's like carrying a millstone round our necks, you see. As followers of Christ, we know that when we confess our sins, it brings reconciliation with our maker. With that confession, our relationship with God is... Um, a bit warped at our end probably with God our confessions bring about the transformation of our inner spirit isn't that great I'm reminded of the account of King David's confession in Psalm 51 the outrageous confession he had slept with another man's wife but he confessed it was followed by remorse, followed by a clean slate. That doesn't take away the fact that it was outrageous, by the way. It was all, hunk it wasn't all hunky-dory. Uh, for, for despite confession, great damage had been caused. The king had committed adultery and sent uh, the woman's husband to his death. Though he was forgiven, the consequences of his wrongdoing meant that others suffered enormously so. But Psalm 51 is known as a penitential psalm and confession is a discipline which we must practice regularly, just as Foster says. The general confession, uh, confessional is great because uh, there are no caveats. It's a, a straightforward confessional. We have sin, therefore we have to seek forgiveness. Uh, it, it covers a multiplicity of sins. It, it, it is generic. But there may be times when we have to confess the specific sin in the presence of God. But in the times that our own private confession doesn't comfort us, we may need to go to a church leader or another member of our Christian community to confess our sins. The discipline of confession to a fellow brother or sister is particularly powerful. It brings sin into the light. 
Foster writes that confession is the common property of God's people. Isn't that fantastic? So in theory and hopefully in practice, we ought to be confessing left, right and center. <laughs> Easier said than done, I think. Um, Foster rightly advises that uh, if we are to make a confession to a brother or sister in Christ, that we ensure that they are people who are people who are able to uh, com uh, keep a confidence. Certainly in my experience, and I'm sorry to say this, just because someone professes to be a Christian does not mean that they are able to keep confidences. Uh, some people just don't have that gift. So my suggestion would be to ensure that we choose our confidence wisely. If you are the person receiving a confession, please give the confessor time to speak. Please don't feel the silence, for during that silence, God may be speaking to you or to them. Or silent prayers can be uttered. And, and now a caveat, I, I, and I imagine this is very obvious, but I want to make it very clear. The types of confessions I'm talking about here is, is not about breaking the law, for that would be dealt with in a very different way, uh, which I won't go into right now. But I'll leave you with this. True, authentic confession. True, authentic remorse. And true, authentic announcement of forgiveness is truly powerful. So confess away, brothers and sisters. Which reminds me, I also need to practice what I preach. It's going to be a long list. <laughs> so God help us all. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and loving Heavenly Father, you grant us joy and healing when we come to you in repentance and faith. We are so grateful for your forgiveness and rejoice that you have reconciled us to yourself through Christ and through him you have committed to us the ministry of reconciliation for this troubled world for which we now pray. We really appreciate this beautiful world you have placed us in, the colour and variety of nature, and yet we know it groans whilst waiting to be renewed as we also wait for the redemption of our bodies. Lord, we commit to you the problems of climate change and pray for all affected by it, for those grieving the loss of loved ones, property and livelihoods through flood, landslides, drought and wildfires. We pray for world leaders as they seek to find ways to accommodate climate change and ask for wisdom too concerning the global pandemic, praying that the wealthier nations will grant aid in providing vaccine for poorer ones. We are also mindful of the continuing plight of refugees and the innocent victims of war-torn countries. Have mercy and sustain those who provide aid. We consider those who remain anxious in resuming a normal pattern of life, bringing them to you and praying too that the virus will lose its potency. Thank you that in the Olympic Games there has been opportunity for nations to come together and that this and the recent European football and tennis have given a measure of relaxation and relief from the stresses caused by the pandemic. We place into your hands families taking time together on holiday, praying for safety in travel and opportunity for growth in relationships. Thank you, Lord, for our church family. We ask your wisdom and guidance for Susie, our church wardens and PCC. We also pray for Eddie and Elizabeth for your continued grace and sustaining love. We especially lift to you all who suffer in body, mind or spirit. May your love surround them and your peace dwell in their hearts. 
For those who walk the difficult path of bereavement, we ask your strength and comfort in their grief. And so, Lord, for ourselves, we pray you will help us by your Spirit to live a life of love, to seek to build others up and not destroy them, keeping in mind that you are always there with your arms wide open, ready to receive us in love and forgiveness. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
cry is heard Come forgive our sin and heal our world Oh, hear our prayer Oh, hear our prayer Sing it, oh, hear our prayer Thanks to all those who have helped put the service together this week for our readers, Penny and Tony, and for Wendy leading us in our prayers. And of course, special thanks to Hasna for sharing her wisdom with us once again. Richard Christopher is leading the service in the building this morning. Um, so thanks again to him because I'm on holiday and uh, we just really appreciate everyone who gives of their time and energy behind the scenes as well to put the service together without a team it wouldn't happen so as we go out into the week thinking about what confession might mean to us and the freedom that it brings and the love that we find in Christ a blessing as we go the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and those who you love this day and forever. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.